So the Intel framework is a part of Bro that has been in Bro since 2.0, and I apologize for it being completely broken and utterly useless in 2.0 and 2.1. This is essentially a completely new thing. Um, go ahead and start. So I've been asking people for, I guess, about four years now, what is intelligence? And I never get a good answer. Maybe I've never asked David Bianco. I don't know. But everyone that I ask, I get a really unsatisfactory answer, for, for me at least. So I've been thinking about this for years and years. And what I finally decided in Bro, intelligence, according to the intelligence framework, was going to be it's an atomic bit of data, which just means one thing with associated metadata. But then, you know, it's sort of the more macroscopic level, it's something you want to know about. It's something that someone has applied some judgment to. This is good, this is bad, this is interesting. It's something we want to know about. We want to know when we see it. And David, please feel free to, to comment or whatever as I go. So the motivations were that intelligence-based searching is just seriously, unbelievably common. And I, a lot of people don't do it. There's tons of data available. So just let's take a data set. When I was at the Ohio State University and we used the, this data set, and it was really, really useful for us, Zeus Tracker. How many people are watching on your network for hits to, to the Zeus Tracker, the, the Zeus Tracker .abuse .ch. How many people are watching for that? How many people aren't watching for that? Well, most of you didn't raise your hands, <laughs> but um, it's one of those things where it's, it, it frequently will be just enough of a hurdle to really effectively use the data that it just doesn't happen. So the intelligence framework was an attempt from me to say, well, I'm going to make it so easy that there's no reason you don't watch for this stuff. The other motivation, though, was um, through abstraction, we can span, expand the utilization. If you have an IP address, right, you, you, someone has told you that this IP address is bad. It's horrible, horrible, horrible to talk to this IP address. What are you going to do with that? So those of you that are, that are watching, I don't know. I, I, don't, I guess I don't have a good example for that. But how many people do intelligence matching with NetFlow or, or something along those lines? How many people go deeper? One. OK, and, and a, a quaky hand in the back. How many people would like to go deeper, though? Yes, exactly. Who wouldn't like to go deeper? Through abstraction, we can do that. Suddenly, if you say, this is a bad IP address, suddenly you're like, well, I can watch for it everywhere. I don't have to watch for it in NetFlow. I don't have to watch for it in IP headers. And I keep flogging the same example because it's easy. But for one thing, in Bro, in the, SM in the SMTP log, we're actually extracting and building the path that that email was indicated to have traveled through, so the received headers. We actually go and extract that as IP addresses. So one of the things, and this is already built in, Bro watches the IP addresses in the received headers. And so if you tell it an IP address, it'll tell you, oh, well, you know, this email was in a received path, or this, sorry, that IP address that you told me you wanted to know about was in a received header and email. And that's what you really want, right? If you see it there, tell me. It doesn't mean I want to do anything about it, but I certainly want to know that it's there. At the very least, I want to log that it was seen there so that I can go back and look through sort of these intelligence discoveries whether or not there's any action taken or any sort of response taken. The other motivation was really sort of along that same line of abstraction, where if we create a format for, for importing intelligence, suddenly Bro is targetable. People that have data can output it in a way that you just point Bro at that data, and guess what? You're matching their data. Because it's all about removing the speed bump. It's that little tiny speed bump. I, I'm, I know a number of you in here are incident responders. How many times have you decided not to do something because, it, maybe this is just me, decided not to do something because you would have to spend two minutes and write a two-line shell script? Exactly. 
And you, you get it done eventually, but it takes six months or a year when you're suddenly one day like bored and you finally like write that thing and do it. So a lot of the work was around removing the speed bump so that you remove that sort of, that one little tiny bump. So it's like, just tell bro the data is there. That's all you have to do. Just put it there and tell bro. And, and having bro targetable is nice. It, it, if we get various you know, open intelligence providers, I'll start out putting data in this admittedly ridiculous and trivial format. It just makes it very easy to sort of pull that data in. So how common is it? I mean, everyone knows there's lots of open intelligence feeds, lots of security industry reports. And there, there are these systems where you can say, you know, here's the report, extract all the indicators from it. And I changed the terminology. I wanted to point this out. David Bianco did a blog post, what, a week, two weeks ago? Oh, yeah. And he used the term indicator in it a lot, which I know is a pretty common term, but I'm not really in the intelligence, you know, dealing with intelligence community for the most part. Uh, I changed the terminology in Bro to indicator before you did the blog post. <laughs> Just wanted to point that out. You can refer to Git, it's in there. <laughs> I, I just, it, was, it was nice for me because I work on this stuff you know, independently. I talk to a lot of people, but I don't really deal. I, I probably should talk to David more because he, deal, he thinks about this stuff a lot. But I, I more talk to people that deal with how do we use this data and things like that. And I just try to make their problem, the problems they have nicer. I don't think you want to make problems nicer. I fix their, help try to fix their problems or smooth their speed bumps. So anyway, you have like you know these intelligence reports or not intelligence reports, but various you know some like Symantec will come out with some PDF, and for whatever reason, they've included 400 domain names in a PDF. That is totally useless. Wouldn't it be nice if they included a bro intelligence file along with it, and you could just grab it and shove it in, and bro's like okay, and starts reading it in. So that's why if we make Bro targetable for intelligence providers, there's sort of a, there's a really big benefit. There's, and I know no, one's, no one can talk about them, but there are tons of intelligence sharing communities, and it, half of you probably have your feet in three. And they probably all have the same data from the same providers, or at least there's overlap and stuff. And it doesn't matter anyway, because a, lo a lot of intelligence data has problems, and it's really hard to use. And then many organizations are building their own internal intelligence teams. And I've talked to people at some of those teams, and I, I still, unfortunately, don't get answers that are very satisfactory to me from those teams. But um, So anyway, there, there's this idea of sort of internal intelligence, privately shared intelligence, publicly and poorly shared intelligence, and public and maybe better shared intelligence, but still not standardized. And I'm not talking, I, so, sorry. Maybe we should cut that. I didn't mean to say standardized. I hate that because inevitably that leads to, well, let's build an XML format. <laughs> <laughs> this is not an XML format. This is a trivial, ridiculous toy format that works. Because that's all I'm interested in. All I'm interested in is consuming. So reduce. The, the benefits of abstraction, you suddenly get to reduce. If you have the same IP address, if, say you're taking in 30 feeds of intelligence from 30 different providers, and they all have the same IP address in them. You only need that once. I mean, you don't care. The fact that it matched on those 30 is an after-the-fact thing. When you're actually doing the matching, you say, is it, is it something that, that is in the list of things to, that, I, that the user wants to know about? You say, yes. Then you get to step back and say, okay, which ones was it? And then you can actually provide them and tell them it was in that feed, and that feed, and that feed, and that feed, and they had all this metadata attached to the various ones. You get to reuse. <laughs> you get to reuse what I was talking about earlier. Suddenly you can take an IP address and match it all over the place. You can take a URL and, and you know, let's pull URLs out of email. Let's pull URL out of web pages, maybe. I, I don't know about the feasibility of that working, but. You can start reusing this data to match everywhere, not just saying, well, we're going to look at DNS queries. And uh, Richard actually gave me a copy of his book on Tuesday, and he had a, there was a blurb in it about my APT1 script. And it said that, that I, first thing I would probably say is that 
well, it, you know, I didn't, I was a quick one-off, and it was. I, I wrote it in about an hour, and it had, I mean, the, the sum total of it was three if statements. And, you know, that just looked at tables. I wanted desperately, because the Intel, the Intel framework was done at that point, and I deliberately didn't use it because I was targeting 2.1 so that people could use that script. I could have targeted 2.2 and said, forget you, run git. But, you know, I figured that wasn't very useful. So I went ahead and targeted 2.1, and it was sort of hacky and didn't, didn't you know, look very deeply in the data. Like, for instance, say you have, um, here are the examples an IP address, but say you have a domain name. Domain name could be in a query, a DNS query. It could be a DNS CNAME response. It could be the host header in, in um, the host header in uh, HTTP. <laughs> First time I've ever blanked on HTTP. Um, it could be the domain name of a person sending email over SMTP. It could be. When you start going down that route, the list just goes on and on. But do you want to just watch for it in all those places? Maybe. Why not? And then, sort of for us internally, you can optimize. There's not a lot of optimization going into it right now, but there is a little bit on clusters. There's, if you have a lot of metadata attached to your intelligence, right now, Bro just reads it all into memory. But it actually creates a minimal data store that's significantly smaller, about um, an eighth or a tenth of the size of the full data set frequently, from my experience. And it pushes that out to all the workers. So there is actually a big reduction in memory. And there are a lot of other optimizations we can do, and, and will do over time. But for now, you know, it is what it is. But the abstraction opens that door. Because right now, you look at the APT1 thing, and there's like, a set of addresses or a set of domain names, things like that, There's, I can't abstract that at all because every single script that every person writes is going to be like, I'm going to do my intelligence and pull it in and make my own set. So suddenly there's just tons of these little silos of data in Bro and there's no abstraction. We can't optimize that. But now, if everyone starts putting their data into the Intel framework, we can start saying, well, how can we, how can we match on 100 million pieces of data in real time? which is one of my goals. I, I know of one data set that has about 100 million pieces of uh, data in it, and I want to be able to match on that eventually, in real time, in a memory effective way, or memory efficient way, I don't know. So here's the intelligence format. I told you, it's very simple. It kind of spawned from that first question, what is intelligence? And I sort of, I did a lot of looking at Zeus Tracker and just staring at the data and thinking about it. And it turned out that all these intelligence formats that have, you know, just tons of like schema pieces and they all link to each other and they're, they're just a huge mess. And the first thing out of everyone's mouth is, we're going to implement that thing, but only a subset of it. And it's like, well, as soon as you have lots of people saying we're going to implement a subset, you have all these people implementing various subsets of the same gigantic thing that can describe you know, the universe, which doesn't really help very much, because suddenly that you, can't, you can't rely on anything being there. There are two things that are required in ours. The indicator, and you see that this is, the exact, this is actually our log format, because Bro reads in its own logs. I guess, I don't know if we've ever made that clear. The input framework, the, the normal input for the input framework is bro logs. Bro can actually read in its own logs and put them back into its internal data structures. And that's actually what's going on here. It's just reading in its own log, except that this is a custom one for, uh, for, for, doing, for doing this stuff. So you have indicator, and it'll have maybe an IP address, and then you have to say indicator type. So you say Intel adder. Ind indicator abe.b.com, indicator type, Intel domain. So the two things that are required are that pair, because you have to say, you know, here it is, here's what it is. And then you have to include meta.source. So this meta thing is a separate record, because it's the idea where there are your indicators, and then you could have lots of metadata attached to them, because it could come from 10 sources. So you have to have your metadata that says it's from source one, source two, source three, source four. 
And then you can have other things. By default, I think we have uh, meta.desk for description, D-E-S-C, and meta.url for uh, some intelligence providers that'll have, uh, think, of, think of, I don't have a good example for it, but uh, think of like, you know, maybe some place that they have where people can anonymously contribute comments or something. And, and you know, you could have an actual URL to more information about why that's an indicator for them. And you can also literally just not include these. So you could have one that has fields, indicator, indicator type, meta source, and that's fine. The Intel framework will not complain. It'll take that in, and everything's fine. I, I said data can be stored in a database, and that is possible. You'd have to make a few changes and stuff, but it's really not bad. But by default, the text file thing works just fine right now. There are design limitations. And the reason in Bro that we put design limitations in place frequently at the outset of, of something new we're doing is because if you say this is a desired feature, it blocks you from making improvements. And the improvements are worth more than that feature. So one thing you can't do is say, for instance, in an if statement, you can't say, like, um, you know, is this IP address bad? Like, say, connection established, and then say, is this IP address bad? You can't ask that. You can say, I see this IP address, which you essentially are telling the Intel framework. I see this IP address, and it was the originator of a connection. I see this IP address, and it was the responder of a connection. I see this domain name, and it was in a host header. So it's sort of one way, and you feed, you feed into it. You can't directly ask it. I, I think we will eventually have a way you can ask it, but it's, it's going to be asynchronous, so you still can't. There, there are still going to be some limitations, but this was a direct and deliberate decision. So we actually currently, I, I guess I, I've, I've been trying to sort of do this thing on the side a little bit. There's an internal project. It's only shared with a few people. It takes data from six feeds. I looked this morning, and what the current thing out there is 13,469 indicators. Um, it's only running a few sites. It seems to be working pretty well. The biggest problem is the data feeds are, are lacking context. I, a lot of times, we'll have hits on this stuff. The data feed gave no indication why it was added or, or how old the data is. It just gives nothing, which is what also informed our intelligence format, because so many feeds do that. Here's a bad IP address. And you're like, why? why? What was bad about it? But it's, it's sort of that intelligence providers have actually forced my hand into this incredibly minimal design for, for the intelligence framework. And it's also funny when actually an intelligence provider adds, the, um, adds an IP address for the site you're monitoring into their data because you get lots of hits all of a sudden. Everything that host does hits. So are there questions? So there are some exercises that are listed. I'll get to you. I, I, have, I, I hope you have all sorts of questions. Um, a link from the agenda, there are exercises. It uses, the exercises use that same uh, uh, trace file from the, the whatever, whatever it was called. Anyway, it's indicated in the thing for on the, the memory key. I'll go ahead and, and walk through them slowly up here, too. Um, so, David. <laughs> I know you have questions, at least. Yeah, sure, he's, it's coming. So I just want to make sure, first of all, I guess, that I understood properly. So you said that the implementation for the Intel framework is to actually use input framework to reread the logs? It, it's not. It's not. So the Bro's input framework uses the log format as its input, but in this case, it's not a one-to-one -one parity with the Intel log and the, the, the input things that it reads in. So it, is it the case that if I wanted to match against some piece of Intel, I first have to make sure it's written to a log? You make sure it's written to an intelligence feed, which is that, that format. You can sort of ignore, uh, I, I may have, I, I shouldn't have said those two together. You really just write a file out like that. Oh, and I. No, I mean, like, if, if I have a piece of data in one of those input files and I, you know, I'm observing traffic and I see that that, uh. that thing is in there, will I get an Intel 
notification so if I, I, I don't guess, log that. Yeah, there, there is actually documentation for, for this, and I didn't talk about it a whole lot. I didn't want to go too much into the weeds. I was hoping that the presentation would kind of give my approach and why a lot, why a lot of the, the design happened. The, another part of it is because of Bro's design, this sort of informed how that part of it works. I, I think I'm getting at the right point. Um, it actually says, you. so if you want to say, and there's already a script written that does this, if you want to, to see IP addresses in you know, connections being established, you would, you would handle the connection established event and you would call this function called Intel scene, and then you'd give it the IP address, and you have to create an enum value, and you'd say where it was seen, so you'd say in connection or ridge, which is actually how it works, and then you would give it, um, I have to think. I made oh, it so you can, you can do it, though, without having to log everything. Before. You can do it without logging anything. It's okay. it, logging, and, logging and intelligence seeing or, or uh, data seeing are two different things. So you could turn off all your logs and you're still, you still could be watching all over the place and you can extend where bro watches. Like, I mean, for instance, say you do want to go ahead and watch for URLs in you know, HTTP reply bodies, something like that. You could implement that yourself with a really short script. Do you uh, have any plans to implement like a little bit higher level um, indicators, maybe something that are not strictly just like atomic indicators like domains and IPs. And Could you give an example of what you're talking um, about? Well, let's say like they, there used to be the concept of like the hot URL list of mm -hmm. regexes when you see URLs that match this, which I don't think are supported right now in the Intel framework. Oh. Um, so right now, uh, the indicators are, they're very, very static. Um, you can't do patterns. We're working on a mechanism, and, and I, I can't give any you know, time to completion on it, but we're working on a mechanism where you could do globbing so that you could actually say star.b.com, and it would, it would match, match star.b.com, you know, whatever that means. And we, we have some stuff we're working on, but it's not done yet. And it won't be in the release. So this is like first version of let's see if this works. And Right now, it's also case insensitive, so it actually lower cases everything before it matches, so that even if there's something uppercase, so you can't do case sensitivity, you can't do anything like that. Um, it, this, though, was a lot of background infrastructure work to make this work on clusters and reduce speed bumps and less of uh, being comprehensive because it's nice to get a release out eventually. <laughs> Um, did that kind of answer? Yeah, I think so. Thanks. And the way uh, I do that is basically just have the URLs in a file, use input framework, feed it to a table, and then use HTTP do request, and then construct a URL there and see if that's in table or not. That, that's actually exactly what the Intel framework is doing, right. but it, it's abstracted even a little yeah. bit further. Yeah, so it, this makes it easier, actually, than what uh, yeah. if you do it in individual levels, and it's more restrictive than that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so Ashish had talked yesterday about his Intel framework thing that, that he had had, and this is a slightly more abstracted version of what Ashish had written. Yeah. Is there a limitation to the meta fields that you can have? Uh, no, there isn't. And I will show in the in the demo. There's actually a use of that where it's it's a sort of data driven um, notification. Even um, this is also to sort of answer David's question of more complicated data type or data matching. This is sort of my thought about more complicated intelligence data where you actually say, maybe it's this IP address, but then you could extend, because the records are extensible, so you can just add new fields to meta. And this is actually how the collective intelligence framework integration works. We take the severity and priority fields from, from SIF, and w there's a script in Bro, so you can go look it up. If it's like collective intelligence or something. So if you just sort of search through the uh, scripts directory, um, it adds a severity or a SIF severity and SIF priority 
set of fields to the meta record. And I don't do anything with those yet, and they're not even logged. So it's, it's sort of not really used, but the idea is that eventually you handle this Intel match, and you can say, ah, this was, has SIF data attached to it. So you could actually take some action. Maybe if you have matches on SIF data that are above, you know, um, uh, severity of, of 90, that means you want to do an automatic block. And that's actually something that you could absolutely do in your own script. And that's partly why this took so long. Figuring out this extension model took forever. And it's, it's, it's a little misleading because you look at this at first and it's so weirdly over the top simple and bare. There's just nothing there. That it's, it's, it can be misleading, except that if you want to say, well, you know, it, this one feed has IP address and port. And I thought about that for a really, really long time. I was like, should I have like a second indicator field or like a sub indicator? And I was like, well, no. I view that as a, as a specialized type of intelligence. So what you actually would do is add a meta dot, you know, my, my Intel port or something. And then you would have your own Intel match handler so that whenever something matches, you say, ah, it's in that one feed. Let's dig through the intelligence, make sure that the port matched or something. And I, I think there's something still missing there. Yeah, I'd like I, to work with you on that because we have cases where the the metadata that we have around our indicators and the context that's around the indicator is oftentimes what makes it more valuable than the indicator itself. Yep. So having that context in those meta fields yep. can make or break, you know, false positive rates. Well, and so the thing is, one thing that, that is not really represented here but I kind of hit on it, was that you can have, like this line right here, the, the indicator 1.2.3.4, you can have another line right below that where the indicator is 1.2.3.4. This is not like a, you know, a one time only, and you can have totally separate meta stuff filled out. Yep. So you're not really limited anymore by saying, well, you know, we have to just have like a set of meta, because that's what it does internally, but I don't want you to have to care about this, because this, this line, maybe you have one file because Bro can read in tons of files. You'd have one file here that is just generated by some external provider. You just drop it in place, and it has 1.2.3.4 in it as an indicator. You drop another one over here that is from some other provider, your internal Intel team or whatever, and it also has 1.2.3.4 in it. Why would you care about that? That's, what, that's a, something Bro should deal with internally. And then internally, when it hits, it tells you, I have a set of these meta records. You can dig through them. Feel free. And then that's where you dig through them and you decide, oh, it matched that one, and that's super important, and I need to do a notice, or I need to block something, or I need to send a page. And so it, 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 it really took me an incredibly long time to come to this model for being this simple. But um, yeah, so are there other questions? OK, I can start kind of walking through the demo slowly. I'll try to do it kind of slowly with the time left and don't overdo it. And so these are going to be up on the website probably for the rest of my life. So um, feel free to return to these later if you are looking for reference or something. I wish. I actually wrote this this morning. I kept meaning to get it done earlier, but I didn't, so this was written this morning. So you can see, oh, there, there is a point here. Keep in mind that all field separation is with literal tabs. Double check you don't have spaces as separators. You put spaces, it breaks and does not work. I think that's fair. What you can, though, do is you could have spaces in your indicator. You could have fetchback.com space tab, and that will mean that your indicator is fetchback.com space. So you have to make sure you're doing tabs. But my suspicion is that most of these files that people use will actually be generated from tools anyway, from some other store or something. So I don't really care. So if you just sort of your own fault <laughs> if you output the wrong thing. And I wanted to point out one other thing. There, this, that came out really badly, but that's pound fields. Very similar to the pound fields uh, line in the logs, because this is a log. We just don't ha you don't have to include all those other header fields. So anyway, you have to indicate fields names. That is a tab also after fields. So you do fields tab, indicator tab, indicator type tab, meta.source. 
and then it's tab separating all those. So this is where this is sort of what uh, I was talking to David about just a little bit ago. F load frameworks Intel scene. That's where your that's these scripts that I wrote that I just pulled together real quick. They're only a few lines long that see data. They see IP address. They see domain names. They see all this stuff. You can look at those scripts and see how they work. So you can write your own if you want. Because I can tell I can I think promise you that I didn't. I'm not seeing all the data. I'm pretty sure that's not happening. Um, and actually, uh, uh, one thing I do need to add before the release is I need to see hashes. So right now, file hashes are not being seen by, by the Intel framework, but they will be. So you will be able to feed file hashes in here, and it'll work. So anyway, it's this Intel colon colon read files. So you really just extend that, and you say, load my Intel file. Ignore that at dir thingy. That's just to, so you can package things into a single directory. Um, now, if you run it, it's really easy to run. You give it the, the bro, oh, let's see, bro dash r and give it the trace file and then just load that script that we just wrote. And so, what comes out of that? You have a couple of matches. So, when you have matches, there's this other scene, scene record. Scene includes indicator, indicator type, and where. Because where is really, really important. It, this was one of the things. It wasn't in the Intel framework for a really long time until I suddenly realized where it is is super important. And it, comes, it could come from all over the place. So eventually, I added scene. I said, had added where into it. So you can see the connection that it happened over. So you have the unique ID, timestamp, the connection IDs. So you have ports and IP addresses. You have the indicator itself. So this is saying, here, here's the indicator that I saw, because you gave me 13,000, and this is the one that I saw at this moment. And where was it, or what was it? It was a domain. So now you know it's just a string, but now you know what that string is. You have some, some more context. But you really want more context, so you have DNS in request. So suddenly you know where bro grabbed that data from, and you know what it is, and you know the indicator. And then going even further, there's a sources field. And this is just what we log. I mean, it, you can go further. You could log more or whatever. But this is just the default thing, because the logs were nasty if it went further. And it tells you, ah, it came from my special source, which is what we indicated in the, the Intel file above. And if it came in five Intel feeds, it'll just put them all there with commas separating them. So you'll see you know, it was in all these sources. But then you can see we only gave it one piece of intelligence, fetchback.com. You can see it also matched fetchback.com in this other connection, which was this unique ID. Um, so that was port 53 UDP, obviously, and this is port 80. So again, it's what, what is this string? It's a domain. And, but then you see HTTP in host header, and suddenly you have context. Ah, I saw this host do a DNS lookup for, for this piece of intelligence that I wanted to know about, because I wanted to know when it saw it. And, and you know that it saw it in the host header. So you're like, oh, that's kind of cool. We just saw, we told it we wanted to see fetchback.com. And that's all we told it. And then it told you, I saw it in a request from that host. Oh, and then I saw it in, a, uh, in the host header from that host. And again, you see, we only had one source for it, so it shows my special, my special source. But that one, uh, the one I mentioned earlier, where we have 13,600 some um, pieces of intelligence, that one has duplicate stuff. And when I'm looking through the hits on it, on network, you know, running live traffic, you will see sometimes source one, comma, source two. And it, you actually can tell in there. It's, it's been interesting. I've talked to some of the other people running this data. And it's kind of an interesting data point to know that something hit two feeds. And it's just in the log. I mean, this is an Intel log. This is just a log writing out. It's just another log of all sorts of stuff happening. I actually sat for a very, very long time, and this actually segues well into the next one. I sat for a very, very long time thinking about this, because I was like, the Intel framework should do notices, right? And I kept telling myself, that, or asking myself, the Intel framework should do notices, right? And this was over years. The Intel framework should do notices, right? And eventually, it kept getting more and more questioning. And, and I wasn't sure if it should, until eventually I was going, the Intel framework should do notices, right? And then I realized it shouldn't. 
And I took it out. It, it doesn't do notices. The Intel framework does not do notices. It's like Snort not doing alerts. But if you really think about it, based on the quality of intelligence a lot of times, do you want to know every time something hits? Because frequently there's bad data. Many of these feeds have terrible data in them. and They're, they're just awful. So instead, I figured out mechanisms where we could extend the Intel framework to do notices. It's not in the Intel framework, but it's in the Intel framework because we extended the Intel framework. And it took a lot of thought to figure out how to actually accomplish this. Um, so there's a script in policy. So it's actually policy, frameworks, Intel, do notice. Because, hell, sometimes you do want to do a notice. So we're going to go with that same, exact, uh, that, that same exact Intel file, except the difference here is that it has meta.do notice. And if you look at that do notice script, you can see how incredibly simple it is. It's, it's just a few lines long. And I actually just wrote it like two weeks ago when I suddenly realized that I should do notices before the exchange. So I had meta.do notice. And then you say t. This is, this is data-driven notification. You're not saying, it's not policy I'm even creating in Bro. This is driven by the data itself. And I guess I should point out one thing. Bro will update this data at runtime. If you suddenly were like, so say you have this li list of data, this text file you're keeping this stuff in, and one day you're like, I do want to be notified about that one. You go into it in, in VI or whatever, and you change F or to T, and suddenly you start getting notices. You didn't restart Bro. It, it loaded that in again, distributed it out to all the workers, and it started sending you notices. You didn't actually change any policy in Bro. You didn't, it's data-driven data notification. But keep in mind, this is just a silly example script that I wrote real quick that's like 10 lines long or something. It's not anything complicated. And you can sort of do whatever you want by writing your own script that sort of has your own behavior that you want. So if you run that, what you actually see is you have the same Intel log. Now you have a notice log. And your notice log says Intel notice, Intel hit on fetchback.com at DNS in request. And then it has some, uh, just some other data. Like this is the subfield. So you actually have the indicator in the subfield. And it, it's, it's a normal looking notice. But we changed it to that just by adding that. That was the only change we really made. And we loaded a script that's already in Bro. But then I thought about it. And I was like, ah, hell. It's one extra line. I'll go to the next step. I added a thing where you could actually say, if in. So you have meta.do notice. This isn't that same do notice script. So you load the do notice and this just gets turned on. You can say meta.do notice, true. I want to know when this happens. But you know what? I only want to know when it sees it in the host header. I don't want to do a notice if it, if it sees it like in a DNS request or anywhere else, just if it's in the host header. And this is something also that could be just extended a lot. It, this is a really simple toy example, but it was like one or two extra lines of code to add that. So I went ahead and threw it in. So again, it's the same exact script. It's just loading intel3.dat. It's, it's really nothing. But then now the solution doesn't say, it doesn't show. It only shows the one that was, uh, you know, saw, we saw fetchback.com in host header. If you look in Intel log, both of those hits are still in Intel log. Because we like to log, right? I mean, bro likes to log stuff a lot. So if we see something, we're just going to log it. But if you want to do a notice, that's totally different. Doing notices is way different than logging. So now you've decided that I only want to see if it's in the host header. And there you go. It's in the host header. And you suddenly have, have a notice. And that's, that's kind of it. Are there questions? Because I could have gone 10 times longer with this, uh, this, this exercise thing. But I actually ran out of time because I woke up late this morning. <laughs> <laughs> So this is, uh, this is very similar to the sum stat thing. And it's something I've been really sort of thinking about and, and just bugging people about in a way that they don't realize this is what I was talking about for a very long time. 
And uh, Vlad, do you have a question it looks like? Um, so I was just going to ask, so where are all the places that Bro can look for this intelligence right now? Good question. And actually, honestly, not a question I can answer off the top of my head because I wrote these scripts and I forget what I did. So let's see. Yeah, I'll go, I'll go ahead and pull the scripts up. That's actually good. I, I can show... Uh, can show some of these scripts that actually do it. Oh, not there. There we go. Um, so you got you have C scripts. Well, this is in the source tree at least. Scripts, policy, frameworks, Intel, scene, and you have these scripts. So this is seeing some that does not look so great. So this is seeing something. This is seeing IP addresses used in connections. And there's this thing with TCP established because you'll, you'll get connection established times when you don't really want it. So this is saying that it really seems to be a fully established connection. And there are a lot of caveats to that that I'm not going to go into. But uh, some connection stuff in Bro is a little hard to understand. So anyway, you call this uh, Intel scene function and you give it a record that gives the host that you saw, the connection that it was in, and where it was. And suddenly, all that other stuff just happens because you, 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 you've seen it. You also have a DNS request. And so you can optionally load these. If you really are only interested in looking at one place, you load one of these scripts, and that's the only place you're looking. Or you write your own script, and that's the only place you're looking. Yeah, I, I had that same reaction, David. I, it, I, it took me a long time to come to this, and I suddenly realized, oh, wait, that's what I need to do, because if I build it all, I don't want to build it into the Intel framework. I don't want to assume people want to look in any particular place. Maybe you want to look nowhere, which is actually what it is by default. If you don't load any of these scripts, it doesn't look anywhere. So here you have that other script might be broken. I had the, oh, I'm sorry. No, actually, there's. It, if you look through these scripts, you'll figure out how it works, and you'll deal with it, and you'll survive. But uh, typically, this is what it would look like, where it would say indicator and indicator type, con, and where. It was an optimization that it said host, but this is sort of an internal, internal thing, so I don't care if it's a little nastier than the external view. So the indicator is query, indicator type. So actually, this is exactly the code that ran that came up with that match for fetchback.com. And you can actually see. So then there's, here's the other one, in host header. So this is the one that's, that found the uh, domain name in the host header. And you really start to see how simple these are. I mean, I spent an incredibly long time trying to get these this simple because I, I, didn't, I kept doing things I didn't like. We'll skip that one. That one's kind of nasty. That one too. This is certificate hashes, maybe. Oh, this is pulling email addresses out of certificates. Because if you tell bro an email address, don't you want to know where the email addresses are and find them and see them and have it tell you? Of course you do. Of course you do. So you're checking the domain name there, Seth? Uh, actually, that's one of the things I, I've been meaning to do is whenever you, uh, I, I don't think I'll do it this way. I'll probably make it deliberate where when, um, oh, you're right. It doesn't look at the domain, the server name indicate. I might have a separate script for that. Um, but yeah, so I mean, this is the thing. Like, I, I, I need to do a little more work on these before the release and look in a few more places. There's a few things I know I'm not looking for already. But you get the idea where if I tell bro an email address, find the email address. That's sort of the, the point. Uh, it's the whole point of the abstraction slides that I, I showed, because that's the main motivator for this is abstraction and ease of use. Yeah. I, I was trying, that's what I was actually kind of hopping down through. Okay. So all that is, is it's an enum. And I just did it this way because I could put them all in quickly and I didn't have to think much about it. I could actually reuse them if I found things that something was reused. But you have things like SMTP, and there was a script in there somewhere, in X originating IP header. 
If you tell bro an IP address, do you want to know if you see it in an X originating IP header in SMTP? Of course you do. It's this continual thing of, of course I want to show it everywhere. There's even SMTP in message. Because one thing we're doing is it, it use, it's, it's hacky, like, like many things in life, they're hacky. Right now, we'll, we'll get it fixed actually later. We have a technique that'll probably fix it. But pull URLs out of email and see them. Because if you tell bro about a URL and it's in an email, do you want to see it? And do you want to know about it? Of course you do. So you, I mean, this, I think, should give you a pretty good idea of the direction that a lot of this went in, where it was like, let's see all over the place and see all these different things and then try and find them and actually tell you it found them and tell you what you told it back. You told me about it, and it came from this feed, and it had this metadata, and it had these extra fields like, oh, you said in this one case, you said you wanted to do a notice, so I'll do a notice, because you wrote a script that does that. Um, we have a lot of problems with uh, X forwarded for in HTTP headers. Like, um, it, would it be easy to add uh, yeah. HTTP? I, I'll, I'll add that. That's, that's really not a problem. Sure you can, but I'm just curious if right now you're implementing that list uh, entirely for all indicator types, or if you could very simply, you know, dynamically create a list like that um, for uh. each of the different indicator types so that they map and they source from those differently. Well, this is not indicator types. No, I realize that, but if I only wanted, you know, maybe you have 35 indicator types that you're tracking, right? Uh, what do you? What's an indicator type? Maybe that's what I need clarification. The difference between an IP address, an email address, okay. um, a, right. a string, a user agent string. Okay. Yeah, so, so that we're on, we're at least on the list. same page with the term yeah. indicator type. Yeah. So for each one of those indicator types, could you know you have a, a separate enum list like that, for example? Um. Yes. Yeah. That's actually the indicator types right now, at least, are. I'm gonna have to pull this back over. Oh, that, that is a good point. I should have really shown what ones are built in right now. There's, there's, they sort of don't matter, but it, the, I suppose it does make a difference. So, so that's looking, in with that, we're looking for all indicator types in all of those places, basically. Just yeah, that, that's kind of the idea, where it's appropriate. OK. Because and it's all based on those other scripts I was just showing, because it's saying, I see this email address, and it's in the from field of an email. So it, it, the indicator type and the indicator where, and, and the indicator type and the scene where mm -hmm. are two different things because, right. but you know, some of them are going to have obvious things like um, in reply to, you're not going to have like, actually, I could see a domain name being matched here or an email address being matched here. So you do have overlap on these and, and it was sort of, I ran into a lot of these troubles of having this clear in my head as to what was what and how they would get used. But, um, but yeah, I can certainly see many of these having, uh, having reuse. So, I mean, even HTTP in URL, that's like the request URL. And I could certainly see, well, the ho in host header is a separate thing there. So that's not going to repeat itself um, or, or have two different types of data fed in. But like X originating IP, that's really only going to be IP addresses that are ever fed into there. Um, so if you look in base frameworks Intel main, here are indicator type, IP address, URL, and that's URL without the prefix. So if you match like HTTPS stuff, I don't really care. It's the domain name and the, the path, so it, it strips out. I think it strips that out, I don't know. I, I have to look at it closer. <laughs> Software name, I'm still not, I'm a little conflicted on that. Email address, domain, username, file hash, certificate hash. So it's sort of these things that, that you tend to see in intelligence feeds. G going back yeah. to your uh, definition of scene, uh, it, you're only looking at a connection established. Did you uh, consider, I guess, the connection attempted? Just because, like, if, that's if something you could add on. yourself. I, I view, I chose to view that as low value for for what I was designing this for. Um, but you could certainly do that because the reason I did is like, so say, say from an intelligence feed, you get you get a whole list of scan active scanners on the internet, and you put that in, and you get connection attempted, and the scanner hits you, and it says, I see it everywhere, and it's like, well, yeah, it's to scan your network because that's what it was doing. What's much more interesting is 
So that'll get detected through scanned-up bro. So from the intelligence side, I don't, I don't care so much about that. But if that host sends an email, that's very different. And that will get detected because that would be in the indicators. But if that host attempts a connection, like Rakana's and stuff, we should be detecting other ways. But it's a still a script you could write on your own without messing with our base add, stuff. Add you could extend the Intel framework to make that work. OK. So I, I chose to leave it out very deliberately. And actually, I think I used to have it in there, and it was annoying, so I cut it back out. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. Is there any way to extend um, the Intel feed file that you generate initially yeah. um, to instead of working off of maybe a specific uh, domain or user agent, you could feed it some sort of uh, algorithm to say if a domain or a user agent matches this algorithm for maybe a specific seed time, perhaps? Uh, <laughs> that, that, was, that was actually something I considered in, in, as I was designing all of this, and no. OK. <laughs> That is, that is a good question, but one of, one of the issues with it is I've tried to reduce, in that scene call, I tried to reduce the active code path in that as much as I could because it gets called a lot. Sure. Um, and I realized that if I stuck algorithm stuff in there, it would overdo it. And so I kind of went the other direction where I viewed algorithm stuff as write a separate script. And I, I think that's a better approach, because that's, that's sort of a design limitation that I deliberately put in, because it, it would expand in an unknown way that code path. And I wanted to keep very tight control over that code path when scene happens. Hmm? Well, yeah, there, for instance, Liam pointed out, for instance, I, a while ago, I saw on some mailing list or something, someone had posted the, the G01 pack algorithm, and so I just implemented it in Bro. And I've heard of some people that are running that script that have actually had hits on it. It's sitting there every, Vlad apparently raised his hand, so Carnegie Mellon has had hits on it. Um, it sits there every half hour, every five minutes, and just generates the next hour and the previous hour's worth of uh, domain names that it will be using and looks for those. So. Those could be f those names that it generates could then be fed into here. So that's absolutely. I might. No, I didn't do that because again, that script I was trying to target to one. But that would be the right thing to do because then if you see it in email, you see it other places, it might mean it have some significance. So I guess I should point that out. Inserting intelligence can be done in a bro script. So you could actually have a worker that sees something and decide, and you have a script that then decides, well, this, is, this data is now interesting. Insert it. And this doesn't matter from your perspective, but I'll say it anyway. It, send, it actually will send that back to the manager. The manager will do the normal data import thing. And then if it's new data, it will actually push it out to all the workers. So there's a whole distribution mechanism built into the, uh, into the thing, even on clusters. I was just going to ask if you could kind of go over the SSH brute forcing stuff and how that might use the Intel framework. You mean how I made it stop using the Intel framework? Yeah, it doesn't do that anymore because it wasn't, wasn't reliable enough. If we get a, better, a more reliable mechanism later, I know, I know. If we get a more reliable mechanism later, so Vlad was asking about, it's sort of pivoting off that question about, or the comment about um, inserting intelligence locally. So there's a script that guesses if an SSH connection was successful, and it is a guess. It tends to be useful. I've caught tons and tons of incidents with that script. Yeah, exactly, Jim. <laughs> Lots of incidents with that script have been caught. Um, but it's so, sort of unreliable. It's just taking a wild guess if something's successful based on some criteria of how the connection behaves. and. Um, the, my idea was, ah, this is cool. I detect something SSH scanning, or sorry, SSH brute forcing. Let's add that as intelligence, because then what we can do is whenever there appears to be a successful logon, that is something that, it, that is, it, it'll be in the Intel framework, and it will tell you when it successfully logged on. It turned out that was a bad idea because, um, at least in a lot of higher ed places, it would misidentify a lot. So something would go and do a bunch of SSH, and it would say, 
it's brute forcing even though it's just logging in and it's behaving in a way that triggered the, uh, the brute force thing incorrectly and made it think it didn't log in even though they successfully logged in. And so it, you'd have this intelligence, you'd get these notices that say, An, a brute forcing host has successfully logged in, and it didn't frequently. So if we ever get to the point of having more reliable indicator for SSH success and, un, and failure in logins, that makes it significant, and then we would change, absolutely. Yeah. On a kind of a simplistic level, you're just uh, replicating a process that we're doing manually right now. That's yeah. just kind of how I see it. Yep. Okay. It's getting rid of road bumps. I mean, that's, that's the biggest thing here is getting rid of road bumps and making it possible for us to do optimizations eventually. Uh, do you have any plans of making that? Script? Wait, hold on. What? Um, any plans of making that data that you're you know, putting back into the uh, Intel framework persistent? So perhaps writing it back to the data store that you're reading in from? Uh, there hasn't been a lot of consideration for that, but there hasn't been a lot of consideration for all sorts of things. And that was deliberate design so that you can actually extend it to make it do all sorts of different things. I, I mean, the real goal was that there's you know, this sort of unlimited list of input, output, all these sorts of changes you could do. And I left that up to be done later. So I, I deliberately, I kept adding stuff like that. I would add it, and then it would be there for a month, and I'd be like, I shouldn't be doing this here, and I'd pull it back out, and I was like, this has to be as incredibly simple as I can possibly make it, while still leaving the door wide open to doing customization extensions later that don't actually need to go into the core Intel framework. The whole Intel framework is like, uh, so here, this is main.bro. There's two other files that represent the Intel framework. Main.bro, though, is most of it. The other two are for adding cluster support for the data distribution stuff and for supporting the input framework. Actually, if you want to see, this is the entirety of how, uh, this is all the support I had to do to make bro read in from disk. I wrote that in 10 minutes and suddenly, ha ha, bro can read intelligence at runtime <laughs> off of disk, you know. Uh, so, I mean, the sum total of code, even in here, is with spaces and everything, three, um, 326 lines of code. It's an incredibly small amount of code. And it's all script land. There's nothing in the core that's like optimizing any of this. It's just a bro script I sat down and wrote over four years. But granted, this expanded and contracted and expanded and contracted and expanded. There was one point, actually, at the, uh, the Bro Exchange last year, I was done with this. And on the flight on the way there, I did some testing with a large amount of data, and I realized I had made a terrible mistake. And I actually had to redesign it about 10 times after that because I, I realized I had just done it wrong. It, it, I didn't realize the domain correctly, and I didn't realize the constraints I needed to put in place. And so that was when I really started constraining myself, because I knew I couldn't do it the way I was doing it. It was easier the way I was doing it, but it, it wouldn't work. But from your guys' perspective, you don't notice the change at all. It's all internal, and it's just a few API choices that were changed that made it so I limited myself deliberately. I think the bro exchange is over. <laughs> Oh, there is lunch. Never mind, the bro exchange is not over. The bro exchange termination has been canceled. <laughs> so anyway, if anyone wants to talk more or whatever, I'd be glad to talk about this, because I think that it's, it's still like everything else. There's more work to do. Thanks. <laughs>